Tut Ankh Amun, King Tut, the boy pharaoh, whatever you call him, you would have undoubtedly have heard of him before. Whether you are interested in ancient Egypt or not, the image of Tutankhamun is ingrained within our memories. His tomb, filled with golden treasures, was discovered on the 4th of November, 1922, 100 years ago, this year. A young water boy, helping at the dig of Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon, dug a small hole to place his water pot into for it to not fall over. However, he found the first steps leading to the tomb beneath the sand. He immediately alerted Howard Carter, and the rest is history. Since 1922, when the first images of King Tut spread worldwide in the newspapers and cinema reels, the world was yet again swept with Egyptomania, or Tutmania. And with that came the worldwide craze to know everything about the boy king. He has been portrayed in hundreds of documentary reenactments, movies, TV shows, and even resurrected as the cartoon Tuttenstein. An endless list of books and publications and National Geographic magazine covers later on. We know so much about him, but he still remains a mystery. His golden death mask continues to draw in thousands of people from all over the world who are captivated by its eternal beauty, including myself, of course. I was tempted to do a documentary about the 100th anniversary of the discovery of Tutankhamun. However, I see so many media companies that use Tut to get sales, clicks and views. And I decided that I am not going to be continuing or partaking in the exploitation of this pharaoh. Instead, I wanted to investigate our fascination with this pharaoh rather than the retelling of the overtold story of his life, death and discovery. I sat down virtually with some incredible Egyptologists and historians to hear their opinions on why they believe Tut is still so popular and who Tut is to them. What does Tutankhamun mean to me and to my husband? Well, I'm sitting here on the terrace of the Winter Palace Hotel in November 2022. It's obviously the centenary since the discovery of the Tomb of the Boy King. But it was only six months later that my husband's great-grandfather died. So it's a story of treasure, of course, of far greater understanding of an extraordinary world, but one tinged with family tragedy. And whilst the fifth Earl of Carnarvon was front page news all around the world for what he and his colleague Howard Card had discovered, it wasn't long, five or six years, before he became as forgotten and pushed to one side as had the boy king Tutankhamun. It's been a joy discovering his character, his world, and what drove him to work out here from 1906 until 1923, leaving Highclere Castle, which millions of you know is the real Downton Abbey behind, and instead coming out here to sit working along with his excavation teams in the dusty, debris-filled Valley of the Kings. It was an extraordinary, exceptional discovery. And I think all of us are fascinated with this world of the pharaohs of the sun, with the treasures, works of art and architecture they created. And I'm not sure any of us today have created anything which is nearly as good. 
It's a world of mystery, of enchantment, one which tantalizes us and which the fifth L found entirely beguiling. And in the end, he gave his life for. He wanted to write a book, that's what he wrote. But he died before he could write his book. He wanted it to be available to lots of people to read, not expensive. But anyway, I have written his book, I hope. And I hope you can read his words and his, his thoughts and discover the characters of the modern Egypt of 1922, who discovered the Egypt of the past of 1350 BC. So here we are back again today. Hi, Curtis, it's Chris. I think Tutankhamun is, is as popular as he is and continues to be as popular as he is for lots of reasons. But um, most obviously he is the human face, if you like, of this great archetypal archaeological discovery. Um, I think Tutankhamun's appeal is really all about the treasure, the gold, um, the fact that um, some of the items from the tomb, but most obviously the death mask, provide us with some of the great um, icons we have of ancient Egypt. Um, no, no single sort of image says ancient Egypt like the death mask of Tutankhamun. Um, we all know that you know human faces are the most compelling images we can see. That's why magazine covers always have human faces on them. And the death mask, which is not only crafted of this, you know, these incredibly fine, precious materials, gold and lapis and glass paste and things, um, but it's designed in an incredibly striking way. Um, those two main colours, gold and a deep, rich blue. Um, and then the face is so finely crafted and those eyes just stare right through you. Um, it's difficult to imagine a more finely crafted and more striking image for me from anywhere, from any time. It's the most striking face there is. Um so in some ways, Tutankhamun and his tomb and his treasure, and specifically the death mask, give us the icon for ancient Egypt, um, or, or the ancient past even more generally. But I think I think also part of the enduring appeal of Tutankhamun is, is his story, which we know um, partly from what was discovered in the tomb and particularly from his mummy. And we know from that that he died at a very young age. Um, and therefore that he came to the throne at a very young age. And it's for that reason that we refer to him as the boy king. And I think um, because we think of him in that way, I think there's something in us. It was sort of pre-programmed almost to feel warm towards children. And, um, you know, in, in the way that he we perceive Tutankhamun, even though he died as a fully grown adult, and he might have been a nasty little so and so. How do we know? Um, I think we feel sort of warm towards him, and as though almost as though he sort of needs to be look, looked after. I think the fact that Tutankhamun died as young as he did evokes in us a kind of sympathy. Naturally, you know, he came to uh, some sort of tragic end. We think, um, and that's very compelling too. Um, you know, we don't we don't know an enormous amount about him we don't know very much about his character we don't really know what he was like we don't even really know what he looked like despite all those reconstructions um and and yet just those those simple facts that he was king at a very young age and he died young those are pretty um compelling thoughts and they tell us something very um they they tell a story that i think we want we we want to know more about so i think all those things combined you know the gold those incredible images the story of the discovery of an intact tomb and then the fact that you know it turned out to belong to this rather tragic young figure it's all um it's such a great story you couldn't write it um who's tucked to me i think tutankhamun is almost like a kind of guiding light for me 
in a strange way. I'm not sure how he would feel about that, but um, um, it was two Duncan Moon and the tomb and the images, all those things I was just talking about um, in answer to the question about why he's so popular. I think that those are the things that got me hooked on Egyptology. Those are the things that I had in my mind when I was choosing university courses and um, a university to go to. I, you know, I was I was very keen not just on doing ancient history and archaeology, which is the degree I did first of all, but I, I wanted, if possible, to try and do a bit of ancient Egypt. And I think it was probably too dark moon that I had in my mind. So he's in that sense kind of responsible for for me doing this at all. Um, and and over the years, I feel like he's been very good to me as well. Tutankhamun is a big part of why Egyptology is so popular. And if it wasn't so popular, I'm not sure I would have had the opportunities to pursue my interest in the subject as a career. Um, particularly now, I rely on um, uh, kind of public engagement work, um, writing books and and being in TV things and doing and doing talks. And none of those would be possible um, if people weren't interested and people might not be interested to the same extent if it wasn't for Tutankhamun. Um, and of course, a lot of uh, the things that, it, you know, if people know me at all, there's a pretty good chance that they might know me at least in part for having um, having talks about Tutankhamun, particularly on TV. And I've lost count of the number of times I've, um, I've filmed in the tomb and uh, been in, films about Tutankhamun or aspects of his life and times. Um, so, you know, in that sense, uh, he's been a very big part of, of what I've been lucky enough to get the chance to do in the last few years. Um, so um, I can't help thinking when I talk about this, about of standing next to his mummy um, in front of the cameras um, and posing, posing for photographs and recording pieces to camera uh, in in front of the king's mortal remains, and I have to say that's made me feel slightly uncomfortable at times. Um, you know, how dare I speak on behalf of the king um, when he he these days doesn't get the chance to do that for himself? Um, I, I wonder how he feels about that, and. Um, a bit worried about it <laughs> so um, yeah i feel very lucky and uh, uh yeah if um if i ever this is a mad thought if i ever got to meet him I, I would just want to say thank you very much and don't kill me or whatever kings might do to little insects like me daring to discuss their life and achievements it's the anniversary of the discovery of uh, the tomb of uh, Tutankhamun. It has been unique since even th this time, because it's the only tomb that, for a pharaoh that was found complete. The more than 5,000 objects dazzled the eyes of the world. Even a word has, has developed in a dictionary describing uh, this uh, uh, craziness about uh, Egypt, Egyptomania, and in fact, uh, it should be Tutmania. Uh, Tutankhamun, with his golden mask, became the uh, real symbol of Egypt, a, an ambassador. As an Egyptian, I'm just proud to be a descendant of uh, Tutankhamun. As a child, I grew up in, in Cairo, uh, close to the Egyptian, Cairo Egyptian Museum. And my visits to, to the museum was always highlighted with the, the visit of Tutankhamun treasures, the, the mosque. And as a child, I was dazzled by Tutankhamun, the child and I was wondering how he lived and how he was a king. He was a child like me and he, how he was a nine-year-old uh, king. Uh, I just thought that he would have a life that was full with, uh, with bright colors of, uh, of power, uh, of, uh, of uh, rich. Uh, everything was within his hands. 
But uh, when I just grew and read more and knew more about him, I saw that this must have been a Caius time for him, just changing his name uh, from Tutankh, uh, Aton to Tutankh Amun, changing his, his place, losing his, uh, his father, uh, and ha being in power uh, with all the duties of being a, a king at that uh, young age. This must have been all a burden for Tutankh Amun. The, uh, the, the child and the teenager. And uh, uh, knowing more about uh, the Tutankhamun, the father, and how he lost his two daughters uh, as still-born uh, children, and how this must have affected uh, him and uh, caused him uh, moments of, uh, of, of grief. For me, Tutankhamun is not the, the golden mask, it's not the treasures. Uh, Tutankhamun for me is a, a, a child when, when I was a child, uh, the, the teenager when I was growing, the, the uh, husband, uh, the, uh, the, the, the father. Uh, I see him in, 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 in all the roles uh, of life, uh, not only uh, as a a king, but uh, as a human, a, a fellow uh, Egyptian uh, uh, man, that uh, also he, he is my king. I could think of a hundred reasons why a hundred years later we are still talking about Tutankhamun. He's still the superstar of Egyptology and a household name. If you ask anybody, what do you know about ancient Egypt? They're going to say pyramids and Tutankhamun. So I think there's so many facets to his popularity. If we think about the discovery of the tomb itself, and we visualize the landscape within which that tomb was discovered, it's arid, the heat can get so intense. So to imagine the tomb builders cutting through that sedimentary rock and creating these incredible tombs is so awe-inspiring. And then when we think about the team that were involved in the excavations, they are, <laughs> they are such interesting, colorful characters. So we have Lord Carnarvon, who led one of the most interesting lives I've read of. And then we have Howard Carter, who was a bit of a maverick. He didn't have that formal education, but he was definitely the man for the job. He did an excellent job. And I think what's interesting about um, Carter is that he was very meticulous and very stubborn the way that he worked. So he was, he found himself probably in a situation which he didn't imagine himself, but there were over 5,000 artifacts cramped into quite a tiny tomb. And it took about 10 years to catalog everything. So I think, you know, the fact that he, now that was a massive achievement. And of course, he didn't do it on his own. He had some fantastic Egyptian workers who um, were part of the team and also, we have the forensic team. So in the forensic team, we had Dr. Hamdi, who was an Egyptian doctor. We have Dr. Derry. Howard Carter, of course, was also involved in the forensic side. And then we have Lucas, who was, he basically was involved in forensically analyzing all the embalming materials. And I think, you know, if we put the whole team together, that joint effort, they did an incredible job under very difficult circumstances. They did not have the forensic tools available that we have now. But I think, you know, one of the main reasons why this fascination with Tutankhamun continues is because here we have an intact tomb and here we have 
his body, but yet he's still an enigma. He's still shrouded in mystery. There's still so much that we don't know about his life. And there's so much that we are actually still learning. And I think another aspect of this huge fascination with Tutankhamun is the fact that he died so young. He died so young and everybody wants to know what his story is. Why did he die so young? And that's a very difficult question to answer because when the forensic team found his body, such a copious amount of resin had been used in the mummification process that his body was literally glued into the coffin. So to free his body, they used very drastic, destructive measures to the point that his body was disarticulated and is now in pieces, which has made it very difficult for anybody trying to forensically study his body now, because it's very difficult to know if the lesions that we are looking at, were these created during his lifetime? Or are these the result of post-mortem pseudopathological modifications due to the rough handling of the forensic team, due to the mummification process, and then the burial environment has become really difficult. And then after he was forensically analyzed, after they did the autopsy, his body was simply put in a wooden box and then forgotten about. And then he wasn't forensically analyzed again until 1968. So there's, there's a huge gap. And there's so many things that could have happened to his body during the World War. So there's, there's so much mystery surrounding even what happened to his body. And I think to be fair to the forensic team, yes, they've left a legacy of destruction, but they did have a very difficult task. But thankfully now, we would never conduct an autopsy or treat a human being in that way. But we have to put things, unfortunately, into context and learn from them. And I think the treatment, in a way, the treatment of Tutankhamun's body just shocks everybody and we can only learn from this. We can only learn how not to treat a body. And it does, it does make me quite emotional thinking about it. But now he's, um, his body is treated with respect and it's safe. And hopefully one day, we will find out exactly what happened to him. But the, the fact that Tutankhamun's body was autopsied, mishandled, and it's almost become impossible to forensically evaluate how he died, the diseases he suffered from. We, we, can, we can make educated guesses and you know using ct imaging we we can learn quite a lot about him but of course it's just difficult to know if a hundred with 100 percent certainty um to evaluate if what we're looking at did happen during his lifetime but i think what's happened now is that there's a plethora of elaborate theories as to how he died. And I hope one day we can find out for sure. I hope forensic studies, just through science, through advancements in science, we reach a point where 
we can once and for all find out how Tutankhamun died. For me, Tutankhamun will be always the reason why I fell in love with Egyptology. He's the reason why I started learning more about Egyptology. He's the Tutankhamun is the reason why I'm in Egyptology today. The drive to find out forensically what happened to him, to get to the bottom of it, to, to know why someone lost their life so young, to, to think about his life, you know, to, to lose his parents at such a young age. That's such a tragedy to be born into wealth, power, to be propelled into becoming a pharaoh at such a young age, such a huge responsibility. And during a period of history where there was so much instability, there was so much change, that period of history is actually an anomaly in Egyptian history. It's a little bit of a glitch. So he would have grown up during the Imana period. And from that, he had to shift back into the old religion. And, you know, I wonder what that was like for him. What was it like? Who was, who was the real person in power? Was he just a typical teenager? Was his death caused by him just messing around and on a chariot. You know what? I really want to know what happened to him. So for me, the fascination remains about what's his story? What's his story? 2022 really is an exciting year for Egyptologists. And this year we are celebrating a hundred years since the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun by Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon in the Valley of the Kings. And that discovery and that moment really was an important time and period in the history of Egyptian archeology span and Egyptology. And it helped to, you know, reignite the uh, general public's interest in ancient Egypt. And certainly the discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb if you were to make a list of the greatest discoveries in archaeology, the discovery of his tomb would rank up near the top of that list. And King Tutankhamun has been this really iconic figure for both ancient and modern Egypt and still holds that prominence today. I believe there's a number of reasons why King Tutankhamun is still such a popular and prominent figure within both the Egyptological community as well as within the general public and uh, their interest in ancient Egypt. Certainly the most obvious reason would be the amount of treasures, let's say, or gilded objects or fabulous, wonderful artifacts that were found within his tomb. When his tomb was discovered in 1922, nothing like it have, had ever really been found in the history of Egyptology and archeology span in Egypt up until that point. And while King Tutankhamun in Egyptian history really was just a flash, he was just a brief moment and not really that prominent of a king or a figure, certainly his tomb's discovery was an important event for archeology span and for historians and Egyptologists who study ancient Egypt and specifically who study the state funeral in antiquity or what it was like to bury a pharaoh during the new kingdom. And he still, even 100 years later, serves as this icon of both ancient and modern Egypt as well. So for me as an Egyptologist, Tutankhamun really is this prominent, important figure in my own life as well as in my own research and studies. And early on in my career, I 
you know, really was driven by, you know, the discovery of King Tut's tomb. And, you know, it in a way inspired this idea of, you know, discovery and adventure and ex exploration as an archeologist working in Egypt. And I think it's safe to assume that every Egyptologist, you know, in the recesses of their mind, hopes for a discovery as prominent, if not greater, than the discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb. But also, you know, King Tutankhamun, for my research purposes, is also really important for the study of the state funeral in ancient Egypt. And what did it take and what did it look like for a group of people to come together to bury their dead king? And what were those ceremonies like? What were those rituals like? And what were the things that they interred with the deceased Pharaoh in order to not only perpetuate his funeral for eternity, but to help him traverse between the land of the living and the world of the dead? Why do I think that Duncan Moon is so popular? I think there's a number of different areas to that. One is what I would call the bling factor. People like gold, lots of gold, and you can't really get so much more blingy uh, than to Jan Kamun. Then you've got the, the romance, I suppose, of the idea of a boy king, uh, somebody cut off in their prime um, and surrounded by and then buried, surrounded by all these treasures. There's also the broader sort of fascination with Egypt in general, and in many ways, Tutankhamun encapsulates so many of these, these popular perceptions of what ancient Egypt is about, about the idea of mummies, um, exploration from for tombs, and also the old hokum of the curse and stuff like that. So I think those are one of the reasons why he continues to be so popular. And I think underlining the fact that he in many ways, for, for a lot of people, is ancient Egypt in a microcosm. And his and the recognition factor of his material is such. Nobody really, hardly anybody alive, who won't recognise the mask of Tutankhamun. And, and not have the um, recognition fact of the term, the value of the kings and stuff like that. So I think those are all reasons why I think he remains um, such a popular figure. What does he mean for me personally? I suppose at one level, he is a useful gateway to a period of Egyptian history, which I've always had a great interest in. Um, my first ever published work was on the Amarna period. And in spite of trying to drag myself away over the years, I've always found myself back back with them again. Uh, and then this year, doing the ultimate cliche of producing a book on Tutankhamun to be published in at the same time as the centenary of the um, discovery. Within all that is that to the whole the, that Tutankhamun they, they picks up various threads which I'm interested in. Now, there is the Amarna period per se, but also he's quite interesting from the point of view of looking at him in terms of historiography, um, not only through the, the more recent sort of, sort of tut mania and other kinds of things which kicked off from his discovery of his tomb, but also the fact that when he is first rediscovered in the 1820s, um, there are the questions about how he is, how to, what, what to do with it, as he's missing from the from the extant um, the king lists, the various ideas some of the early scholars had about who he might be, where he might have come from, where he fitted in historically. All of that, I find, a very, very nice case study in the way that um, Egyptology has worked from its um, earliest days. The reason why I think Tutankhamun is so known, so recognised today, there are a number of reasons. Firstly, there was the whole way he was discovered, the way the tomb was discovered, the fact that you have a completely excavated out site in the middle of Egypt, which suddenly has this tomb. And within this tomb, 
they find sparkly, shiny, beautiful things, which we could only have imagined the other tombs would have had. For historians and archeologists, it gives them an indication of what some of the great pharaohs, one of the two, three of the really great rulers must have had within their tomb structures. Because Tutankhamun was not an important boy. He wasn't really known. He was on the throne for nine years. That's nothing compared with so many of the greats. So, for example, the death mask, that amazing piece of uh, gold, the workmanship, and the thing I personally like about it is the fact it is one of the earliest, not the very earliest, but one of the earliest known dated pieces of glasswork in the world. We know roughly when he went into that tomb, that mask was made before that tomb was sealed. So we know how old it is. Other than that, he's, there's just so much history. There's so much knowledge that we've come to understand about it. The fact that Carnarvon died of this strange curse that we all know doesn't really exist, but that captured the imagination in the 20s. You go to houses in this country, there's uh, Mr. Straw's house in the Midlands, and the carpet that was laid down in the 1920s has Egyptian motifs all over it because Egypt was the thing to see, it was the thing to be. And clothing, Erte, he created amazing clothing in the 1920s and 1930s. And there are all these motifs which intermingle with the knowledge that we've got, how it's used, what, very little is known for sure, but he's the thing that people always talk about when they talk about Egypt, because that mask is the thing you get. It doesn't matter where you go, what timeline you're looking at, Egypt equals that mask. Tutankhamun to me is the father of two little girls who were found in his tomb. As a family historian, that is how I think of him. The fact he was buried with them, they are there and they have got a voice because they were buried with him. And that's a link back to the earlier pharaohs, the ones in the future, not so much, but it's that link. He is, he is the father of two small children who didn't survive. And that to me is what Tutankhamun means. We've always loved the idea that the tomb of Tutankhamun should never have been disturbed, that it was cursed, and that when Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon discovered it, they unleashed this curse. And of course, Carnarvon died shortly afterwards. And this was something that the Sherlock Holmes author, Conan Doyle, Arthur Conan Doyle, picked up on. He believed, he sincerely believed that something had been released from that tomb. And of course, the idea of the curse of King Tut has gripped us ever since. It was, of course, widely believed that there were no other pharaonic tombs to be discovered in the Valley of the Kings. So it was always incredible that this tomb was discovered quite by accident and with such amazing treasures so perfectly preserved that it escaped the ancient robbers. And of course, it was a huge influence on the art of the time, in particular 
Art Deco. Everybody was getting into King Tut for years afterwards. As a nine-year-old, I went to the Tutankhamun exhibition at the British Museum when the mask of the pharaoh, the boy pharaoh, was brought over with a load of other beautiful objects. And we queued for hours all the way down Great Russell Street. But it was so amazing to go in to see those artefacts, which we'd only ever seen in black and white in pictures from the 1920s of the tomb. But there to see it in full colour, especially the mask, was a moment of wonder and it's really when I fell in love with everything to do with ancient Egypt. I guess part of the appeal of the King Tut story is the whole question of whether he was murdered. He died so young as a teenage boy. He was surrounded by scheming courtiers, the vizier I, the general Hormheb. And so it's, it's a sort of ancient Egyptian Agatha Christie who did him in? Uh, I know that serious academics don't think that Tutankhamun was murdered, but it's always intrigued us to know whether or not his young life could have been snuffed out. King Tut has this undeniable hold on people, this fascination that still exists today more than 3,000 years after his rule. And I really think a large component of this fascination relates directly to the discovery of King Tut's intact tomb in 1922. This discovery came at a time when it was generally believed that at this point, all tombs of the Valley of the Kings had already been discovered or looted. So when archaeologist Howard Carter discovered this tomb in 1922, after 30 years of excavating Egyptian artifacts, it blew the world away. They discovered inside this tomb more than 5,000 Egyptian artifacts, which included a chariot, tombs, jewelry, perfume, Tut's stillborn children, and of course, Tut himself. This discovery, unlike any before, allowed the world the opportunity to see what it really looked like to live in ancient Egypt and what it really was to be an Egyptian king. It was only through this discovery and the later autopsy of King Tut's body, that it was found that this body, this tomb, belonged to a teenager, and that this person, King Tut, had become king when he was only roughly nine years old. What is so fascinating about Tut is that he only ruled for roughly nine years, and none of his accomplishments are particularly overwhelming. In fact, in the years following his death, his name would be erased from several inscriptions and removed from the majority of the list of pharaohs. Most people, even those that dedicated their lives to the study of ancient Egypt, didn't know about King Tut until the discovery of his tomb in 1922. And yet, I would venture to say nine times out of ten, if you were to ask your average person to name one king of Egypt, one pharaoh, they would name King Tut. King Tut, to me, represents all the best things about loving history. There are, are those like myself that have dedicated our lives to studying history, and there are those that find history boring or mundane or even unimportant. And so as historians, we are always trying to bridge that gap. King Tut does that. King Tut bridges that gap because he provides a wonder that you just can't look away from, whether you love history or not. What I think makes Tutankhamun so popular even to this day is that the discovery of his tomb was unlike anything that had ever been seen before from ancient Egypt. By the time that British archaeologist Howard Carter discovered the tomb back in 1922, he had already been excavated in Egypt for over 30 years. And the consensus among many archaeologists at the time was that all of the royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings had already been cleared. But that idea was shattered once Mr. Carter chiseled through the doorway to Tutankhamun's tomb. Because behind that door was the most intact tomb that had ever been found. A tomb that was filled with thousands of artifacts. It contained weapons, chariots, clothes, furniture, and over a hundred of Tutankhamun's walking sticks. And I can only imagine what must have been going through Mr. Carter's mind at the time after three decades of digging, thinking that all the tombs have been cleared, and then coming across a tomb like this. It must have been quite overwhelming, and that's probably putting it mildly. 
And this kept him and his team working in Egypt for another decade in order to catalog everything. Now, out of all those artifacts, perhaps the one that is the most recognizable is the solid gold portrait mask that was placed over Tutankhamun's head and shoulders. This mask is just an incredible work of art and craftsmanship, and when people today think about ancient Egypt, or maybe even simply hear the word mummy, that gold mask is likely what's going to come to mind. Another reason why I think that Tutankhamun remains so popular even to this day is that prior to his discovery, he was for the most part an unknown pharaoh. Therefore he, along with the contents of his tomb, were shrouded in mystery. And of course, who doesn't like a good mystery? After all, curiosity is a very powerful force that all people experience. And the mystery surrounding Tutankhamun raised many questions. Questions that would go unanswered for years until certain advancements in technology could take place. One of them being, what caused his death? Many have speculated that he might have been assassinated due to a hole that was found in the back of his skull. However, later testing would suggest that this was done during the mummification process. Also, CT scans conducted back in 1995 showed that he had a broken leg, and DNA testing showed that he had also been infected with malaria. So it was likely that he may have died from disease rather than from foul play. And as technology continues to evolve at such a high rate, there's no doubt that Tutankhamun will be revisited to see what else we might learn about him. Now, who Tutankhamun is to me, and what is perhaps one of the most fascinating things about him to me, is how old he was when he ascended into power. He was only nine years old when he became pharaoh, which is of course why he's often referred to as the boy king. Now I find it fascinating because I of course was also nine years old at one point in my life, so I think about what was I like when I was at that age? What problems did I have to deal with? What responsibilities did I have? Now I was probably in fourth grade at the time, and I remember that some of the main problems that I had to deal with were things like being too shy to talk to some of my peers or getting in trouble by my teacher or my parents if I was misbehaving. And I also didn't have very many responsibilities at the time other than going to school, doing my homework, or just simply doing what I was told. I didn't have to worry about a job, paying any bills, raising a family, or anything like that. So for Tutankhamun to be at the young age of nine and then being told that he was now in charge, I think that he must have felt some shock and awe to have such an enormous responsibility placed on him all of a sudden. This also makes me wonder, what did the ancient Egyptians feel like at the time once they had learned that they were now being ruled by a nine-year-old? Perhaps there were those who were very supportive of Tutankhamun. And perhaps there were those who didn't like the fact that the fate of their civilization was now in the hands of a child. <laughs> it also makes me wonder about those who were close to him. I'm sure that there were advisors and other leaders that were loyal to Tutankhamun's father and therefore loyal to him. And I'm sure that there were those who didn't like that he was now in power and they would seek to undermine him. So taking all of this into consideration, I'm not sure how well I would do if I was nine years old I just lost my father, I now have the fate of my nation in my hands, and there are those who dislike me and would like nothing better, better than to see me fail. I mean, talk about pressure. <laughs> so these are some of the reasons why I find Tutankhamun to be so fascinating, and I think that he will continue to fascinate many people for many more years to come. Hi everyone, this is Jan Summers Duffy, Egyptologist, archeologist, and curator. November 4th, 2022 will be the 100th anniversary of the discovery of the tomb of King Tut or KB62. From 1922 up until today, the discovery of this tomb has been one of the most important discoveries in history for archeology, span art, history, and a new science called Egyptology. From this tomb, we've learned new facts about how the ancient Egyptians lived, their art, sciences, religious ceremonies, death practices, and the artifacts they left behind. I've worked in Egypt and studied the tomb and its artifacts for most of my adult life. To me, the tomb represents the idea of an unknown young ruler who is thrust unexpectedly into the foreground of history with many mysteries surrounding his life. The intrigue of what actually happened 
escapes us and is mostly unknown. The discovery of his tomb, including his relatives, his royal practices, and his life leave us with many questions. This has allowed us to delve into never before known topics and never before seen artifacts. This has led to 100 years of research from 1922 up until today. My experience has been that everyone from young to old is intrigued and loves to know more about Tut. It's my pleasure to answer those questions. So there we have it. We can all agree that the intrigue behind Tutankhamun will undoubtedly never fade away, as his life, death, and discovery continue to capture our imaginations for generations to come. He was a significant king in his time, yet his actions were not rewarded justly, and his subsequent successors tried to erase him from history. Yet, this boy king will forever live in our hearts and minds, for if we speak his name, he continues to live in a way. Tutank Amun, the living image of Amun.